Now that it seems most have joined us, we're going to go ahead and get started. Before I hand it over to Ajay Baga to take us through the topic, quick reminder to please submit any questions via the Q&A panel during the presentation. Once Ajay finish, finishes, I'll come back on the line and we'll address as many of these as we can live and follow up offline as well. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ajay who will start us off with today's webinar, Head in the Clouds, Cloud Migration in the Marketing Automation Space. Thank you, Sabrina. Uh, so as Sabrina mentioned today, uh, my name is Ajay Baga, and I'll be uh, walking uh, the group uh, through a presentation around marketing automation and cloud migration. So thank you for joining us today. And uh, thank you, Sabrina, for that intro. So uh, my name is Ajay Baga. I've worked uh, with Munvo for more than, uh, more than 13 years now. And uh, in terms of my background, um, Myself, I'm a, I'm a computer programmer. I mean, I, I love coding, um, but I, I think in terms of my professional background, I'm a computer science uh, degree um, type of person. And uh, in terms of uh, kind of clients I've worked with over uh, the years, the customers re more recently like uh, PayPal, Caesars Palace, uh, Apple, Telus. I've, I've worked with a lot of companies around the world. And I think the lens I've had specifically has been one of an architect in that uh, so I've worked on more of the very complex problems and uh, I've been able to get a lens of someone who's gone really down into the weeds, but then over time and with my experience being able to kind of strategic and then eventually roadmap and, and try to look at like industry trends and, and see uh, topics like moving to the cloud. What does it mean for the marketing automation suites and, and companies that have these, these suites of tools and, and what can they do with them, right? So uh, today I wanted to talk about this specifically and share some of the hopefully wisdom that I've learned over the years and um, talk a little bit about Munvo, what we can do and, and how we can help other uh, organizations out there. So just a little bit about Munvo. Uh, Munvo has been around for more than 13 years. Um, we have, we're certified partners with Adobe, Salesforce, SaaS, and uh, Unica, which is owned by HCL now. Uh, so over these years, we've, we've really grown uh, and our team now is more than 100 uh, consultants and developers. Uh, we also have more than 120 uh, enterprise customers and have over 300 marketing solution projects. So uh, a lot of experience on our side. Um, and in terms of, I guess, uh, some of the expertise, I think uh, after working more than 15 years on different projects, I, we've really tried to build tools that are useful for customers. So our flagship products that we have are SMS Gateway, and this is a tool that allows you to do bi-directional messaging. So doing data decisioning and delivery, and specifically it's focused on SMS today, but in the future it's moving towards just generalized messaging. Uh, and then we have Campaign QA, which is around data quality, and this is really around uh, the relevant message. So if you have a marketing automation system, how do you ensure that it's sending out the correct message and, and to the right audience? Uh, and then, we also have a product called Rewind for Adobe Campaign, and this is around uh, environment replication. So if you have multiple Adobe environments and you wanted to move, or, move around the environment configuration you have, we, we, we designed certain ways or software that allows us to uh, push that information from environment to environment so you can have that replication process uh, within your system. And then finally, Munvo AI, which is kind of a broader set of kind of tools we've built, uh, is kind of anything around data processing. And, and this is where you can get a lot of things like, you know, behavioral detection and uh, event detection on customer actions, right? Uh, and tying that into some sort of black box or AI, right, as we call it. And uh, we have all of these kind of tools that kind of help with not only connecting to the existing infrastructure, but also it connects to some of the future tools like TensorFlow and that kind of thing. So um, we're, we're kind of, all across the board with uh, marketing automation. And you can tell that um, at least our team, we really love uh, this space. So today, what I really wanted to talk about and, and kind of just the breakdown of the agenda, I wanted to talk about what does it mean to go to the cloud? What does cloud mean versus SaaS? What are some key considerations uh, when you're actually moving to the cloud and you have a marketing automation suite? Uh, what are some best practices that we've learned over the year? I have about 10 of those that I want to share with the team and then um, shared benefits and when you're planning for a migration, uh, what do you need to consider? And uh, if you're thinking about the project size and length, I'm just going to share a little bit about that and implementation variation. So what would actually cause a complexity of a project to change and the actual project size to vary? Uh, and then finally, I have a couple lessons or three lessons really that I think are kind of core lessons to share when moving to the cloud, regardless of your state or how mature you are in it. Uh, so yeah, so that's the agenda for today. And hopefully uh, I can address at least uh, share some wisdom, and then if there's any questions at the end, we can we can address those. 
So first of all, what does it mean to go to the cloud? So going to the cloud is really using a cloud system and a cloud system is really just another way of saying we have an abstracted set of computers on a network, right? And the benefit there is that any software running on that system or network is not overtly aware of the hardware, right? So another way of thinking about this from a developer perspective is if you ever, if you ever code in Java and then you, you have your Java code and then you compile your code, it goes into bytecode and runs on a Java virtual machine, right? So that virtualization structure is very much like the cloud. And what is enabled by moving to the cloud is you get benefits like elasticity and scalable services. So when we talk about this, what we're talking about is being able to have certain operations like starting, uh, starting a server or killing a server, and then being able to have mutable parameters where uh, you can have some sort of dyna dynamic action. So if you know what's going on or metrics from that server, you can actually you know, increase the resources or you can kill the server, right? So these kind of processes are possible on the cloud given the abstraction. And then finally, if you're a company and you're a large company, you might notice sometimes that if you have multiple teams or, or groups in your company where they're doing the same operation, uh, sometimes they're gonna kind of reinvent the wheel multiple times. and Moving to the cloud can actually put you in a position where you can start consolidated, consolidating a lot of the, the redundant resources. And by doing that, you can also take advantage of generalized services that are available on the cloud. So things like logging or uh, things like uh, showing certain dashboards, right? Some of, some of that's less built into the cloud services. So it's it's beneficial to kind of take a, uh, take advantage of those tools. Now, class, cloud versus SaaS. If you, if you con consider terms, you hear them a lot, cloud and SaaS. So, Cloud, as I mentioned before, is that abstraction of computers. And then SaaS, that is more of a software, or, or it's more of a term that's used to describe a software licensing and delivery model. And what that is, is really uh, another way of saying, hey, I want to rent some software for a period of time. And where that software is, it's not really of my concern, but I, I know it's secure, right? And in that kind of guarantee, what's happening generally is a, uh, a software company has acquired a, a cloud or some sort of service, right, or, or systems and they're hosting their software on that. So uh, software as a service is more of a description of how you would use the software, you use the software on a set of systems. So it could be on a cloud, uh, but it doesn't need to be, okay? So that's that's kind of the difference between the two. And next, if you consider what's the benefit of moving to the cloud, like why would you even move a SaaS software to the cloud also? Like what's the benefit? So the benefit really is kind of these three main points, I think. So number one, cost of ownership uh, of maintaining uh, on-premise services is very high. So if, if you work at an organization where they have any on-premise servers and you have the IT teams and the processes and all the auditability and everything else you have to do with that, it can be a huge amount of ownership, right? So uh, I think the cost associated with that could be high. Uh, it's possible, but uh, it, it, it can be high, especially if demands for your, your team are increasing. So. I think the one uh, one major benefit of the cloud is being able to assess how much demand I'm going to have in the future. That will allow you to figure out how much resourcing you'll need, and with that kind of variable approach, you're going to save money by by not having to overshoot what your spending is going to be over time. Uh, next, redundant applications and services. So, at a lot of companies, I've seen this practice where uh, a lot of teams are reinventing the wheel. So I mentioned this before, but more specifically, we could call this audit logging, monitoring services, message delivery services. So we take kind of those three, if between multiple teams, so let's just give an example, if you're a big bank and you have US and Canada, instead of both US and Canada trying to implement these by themselves, you could have one shared team or global team that does it together, right? So doing that and going through the moving to cloud process, you can kind of assess that and say, hey, today our US and uh, can, our Canadian teams are uh, reinventing the wheel twice. Instead, could we move to the cloud and consolidate that, right? So I think moving to the cloud does give you uh, an opportunity to kind of reassess and evaluate where you're at today. And many of the times I've seen the reason why there is redundancy is, is pretty organic and, you know, companies are complex places. So uh, it is what it is, but I, I think it's a benefit to move to the cloud to be able to reassess uh, your system. And then finally, the one that's, I think, pretty obvious to most people, but uh, it's important to mention again, is the native integration with a lot of the cutting edge machine learning libraries. So this, an example of this could be TensorFlow, right? So if you move to Amazon or Azure, there's a lot of native integration to a lot of these AI tools. And while that's useful, one thing that needs to be kind of clarified here is that you have access to use it, but how you use it and whether or not it's actually gonna target the right customer is up in question, right? And if you consider that and compound that with uh, legal compliance and liabilities that are possible, uh, depending on, on what, what kind of agreements you have as a company, uh, it's really important to understand who you're contacting, how you're contacting them, and also how you're calculating the decision to contact those customers, right? So that audit trail today, while you could create a system that captures all that, in my experience, I have not seen companies that kind of holistically done it yet, 
But I think that's going to be the next generation of marketing automation tools. Next, I want to talk briefly about common architecture consideration. If you have a marketing automation tool, okay, it doesn't matter which one it is. Uh, I've got big ones here like Adobe, uh, IBM, HCL, Unica, SaaS, Salesforce. So there's quite a few out there. Generally speaking, most of these marketing automation softwares are uh, at least uh, put into components such that they're they're uh, achieving certain parts of the marketing engine. And I, I tried to lay it here on the left here. So I, I, these are the categories I would describe. So data preparation. So getting getting data so that you could consume it within your marketing automation system, right? So this could be either capturing data or data that's going out. Am I recapturing like uh, information that like delivery information back for my customer, right? And then there's marketing oper operations, which is more about orchestrating the whole campaign, planning the campaign, doing budgeting. And then how do you take that strategy or planning information and implement that into a set of campaigns, right? So that goes down to campaign management and creating a set of campaigns, flowcharts, Executing those flowcharts, tracking that information in some form of contact history, right, and that's some sort of uh, customer uh, system of record, and and then finally, when your your marketing engine gets more complex, right, um, you could have problems like, hey, I have multiple customers, uh, multiple offers for the same customer. So let's say I have four offers for the same customer. How do I decide which offer should go to that customer, right? So that scoring and optimization process falls into contact optimization, and then. Uh, the final part of this whole process would be contact delivery. And then if you have a, a QA process or gatekeeper before it goes out, it would be that contact QA. So you could see this kind of different uh, portions or areas of uh, of that mark engine. And I would say kind of in, in terms of maturity in the industry, I tried to highlight where I would see maturity on a, on a general scale across the industry. So I would say, for example, uh, most companies have a pretty good campaign management system and they have sometimes a decent marketing operation system, right? But where you could see it's generally low is contact delivery. I have low and medium, and I would say, let's say medium on batch, but on the real-time side, especially for most companies, I've uh, the real-time integration for most marketing automation tools is while it could work, I would see the adoption to be low. And the reason why is not that the technology is not possible there, that people can't do it. I think the true nature of the problem is that it's kind of double-headed. There's another portion, which is QA. So if you, let's say, for example, you built a system that's attached to the cloud and it's real time, but you're not sure if the data is going to the right person, right? So if your contact QA is not high and you can already see the maturity level is pretty low and it's channel dependent. So if you need to detect if you're sending the right message to the right customer and you don't know, it could become a fire hose. So that's, that's a potential risk that I think a lot of companies, I mean, there's a lot of smart people that are just saying, hey, we have the tools now, we just have to make sure we're responsible with what we're doing, right? And this is kind of where I have the pitfalls of uh, moving to the cloud, but also it's, it's, it's kind of like a benefit, but you have to also consider these as a pitfall because uh, like any, anything complex, it's always a little bit more challenging at first and then, and then you kind of get used to it and it kind of grows very fast, right? So number one is data preparation. So data preparation for all marketing automation software, I've seen that if it's not structured effectively, sometimes the tools can't even work effectively and they run really slow. So one example could be if you have data that's structured in, let's say, customer to account mapping. So one to many relationships. And your let's say your campaign management tool, let's say Adobe, Unica, whatever it is, and you're trying to process the data. If you don't structure the data effectively, there's certain ways or techniques you have to use to rejoin the data or transform it or transpose it, right? All that additional operation, if the load gets big enough, you reach a bottleneck and companies generally find that they've, they've kind of hit some sort of system failure, right? So I think what's important is to reassess, how do I need to use my data? Have I prepared it okay? And if you're going to move to the cloud, take that as an opportunity to say, okay, if I'm going to be data how and, and when do they need that data, right? Uh, next, there's data security and privacy. So on the data security and privacy side, another angle could be, let's say I'm a big Canadian bank and I have, uh, by regulations, I'm not allowed to have certain data elements go outside of Canada, right? And, and all the calculations have to happen in Canada, right? So to abide by that, maybe I could transfer the data to the US server, Canada server, right? But can I limit where I need to send it? And can I keep track of that such that when an auditor comes after, I could show them, right? So that that's an, a new business problem that, that's kind of occurring now with kind of everybody noticing that we have to keep track of everything we're doing to be fair to everyone, right? So um, these are new business problems, but I think the tools are going to transform also towards them. And that's kind of what I'm trying to point at here. Uh, the last pitfall I would say is performance integration. So this is really around if I'm moving to the cloud, let's say I have a system today and I have a real-time channel, am I able to maintain the performance when I move to the cloud? And generally speaking, people would want to not just maintain it, they'd want to improve it. They'd say, hey, I want to take advantage of all the great things from the cloud. Can I do it, right? So uh, 
I think that the truth is, yes, you can. And I think almost always you can improve performance on the cloud, but to be realistic, it may reduce at first. And the reason why is consider any sort of real-time system. If you have, let's say, a database that's connected to your on-premise real-time system, more than likely, if you've had it for, let's say, two to five years, you've tuned that database so it runs very fast with your real-time system, right? If you move to the cloud, even if the cloud's faster in terms of resources, if it's not tuned on the right database, it still might not be fast enough, right? That doesn't mean that you can't spend another six months to tune it and get it even faster. But I would say setting realistic expectations and saying, hey, look, we got to put in the work, but it's worth it. And also being responsible and saying, hey, when we have this access, when we have these tools, we know what we're doing, we're going to limit our exposure, but we are going to take advantage of the new functionality, right? So it's, I think it's a balance with moving to the cloud of uh, a lot of power, but using responsibility and, and with enough diligence, I think you, you can keep track of what you're doing. So next, I'm going to talk about some best practices. So I have I have ten here. I have first five, and then I'll I'll go to a, a chart, and I'll go back to another five. So the first one I have here in terms of best practices is design a system for failure. So number one, build a automated recovery system. So this is really another way of saying if you have let's say a real time system, right? Every node on that system, if it's multiple points on a system, uh, it becomes a potential point of failure. And the more you create nodes on that system, uh, it's going to cause in some uh, aspect, more risk, right? So I think it's a best practice to design all your components such that they will not only deploy, but every time they fail, they try to recover themselves, right? And the reason why is if you then have like, different points in your chain of end-to-end uh, -end communication, you don't have to worry so much about if it's gonna recover. You know it will recover if it tries to, and if it's really bad, it won't, right? But I mean, the thought process becomes much easier and in, in, you're intrinsically building each component to have that, that functionality, right? So I think it's worth to build. Uh, number two is decouple system components. And that's a, a way of saying, okay, let's say we wanted to reduce uh, the redundancy in our company. So if you decouple what each function is doing and, and really focus on each each component application on what it needs to do and, and use whatever's out there already, uh, you start building a practice where you, you build reusable components, it's very modular, and it's bigger and better to scale. So, I mean, this is kind of uh, basic software engineering for most people, but I think this one's very, very important, especially if you go to the cloud, you want to abstract and scale up, right? Uh, and that brings us to number three, which is implement elasticity. And implementing elasticity is really uh, a way of describing uh, how you change your your cluster size of, of the number of com uh, computers on your, your actual network, right? So I have another definition on the next slide, which I'll talk about, but for just a brief moment, what I do, did want to point out here is that with elasticity and that changeability of the cluster size, you can have different schemes. So, so here are some examples. So proactive cyclic scaling, proactive event-based scaling, demand-based auto-scaling. All of these are words that are describing uh, patterns that you're going to follow depending on the metrics that you get back from your, your uh, servers. So if you have a set of cloud servers and they're giving you information about certain events or you want them to scale depending on a certain cycle of time, you can build that kind of scheme with this information. Uh, number four, dynamic data versus static data. So this one is very important. So if you have marketing automation software, I think one of the biggest components in a marketing automation software is what we would call, it's a customer system of record, but let's use the word contact history. Okay, and this is really who are you contacting with your marketing system? And when you do contact them, uh, what information are you keeping track of? And when, uh, when they do respond, what information are you getting back? So all that information, if you have a system where it's regionally separated, Right? So let's say, for example, I give the example of US and Canada before. So let's say, again, we have that, right? If you had two sets of data servers, right? And you wanted to make sure that, for example, uh, the two sets of contact histories are, 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 are in synchronized, uh, part of the challenge we're having here is one of data synchronization data synchronization, networking, security, and, and also processing, right? So, uh, Data needs to be categorized depending on what it is. So there is static data, and this is data where you calculate it once, you could put it on any sort of server. So a good example could be like a content, a piece of content, like an image, right? You calculate what that image is, and then you could put it on a set of caching servers, which are closer uh, geographically to wherever the, the, uh, the, the des destination is, right? Uh, whereas dynamic data is data that you would have to calculate uh, more in real time, or it's based off of some sort of derived information, right? So uh, dynamic data is really important, and it is the, the in information that's more reactive about a customer. It's more time-based, right? And the reason this is important, and it kind of ties back to contact history, is if you have a system of record of the contacts of a customer, right? 
and you don't have a strategy of how to migrate then or merge together dynamic data and static data, uh, you don't kind of have a full picture. So if you ever want to do contact management or contact optimization and you don't have a merging strategy of how do I move together my dynamic data and static data, you don't really get that full picture. So I think categorizing data and figuring out what it is so versus static. And then the other portion you have to look at is if it's dynamic, then it needs to be closer to wherever it needs to be consumed. Right. So if it's on a if it's geographically going to be in Canada that you're going to do some sort of calculation, that data should be on a Canadian server. Whereas if it's in a, uh, the US, it should be on a US server. Right. So uh, what, what's going to be lost if you don't do that is not only just the SLA time or the latency, but also in our current landscape, you have to keep track of where you do the transaction. And as I mentioned before, if you're a Canadian bank that can't do a transaction in a certain country, we have to keep track of that. Right. So um, the more we know and the more we keep track better and we can also design a system that works faster and it's still secure and it, keep, it abides by whatever we need so that kind of leads into number five which is data security and i think this one's pretty obvious to everyone but i think one thing i want to say here is that in, in, in our modern world of the internet there's lots of uh, you know useful tools like tls and ssl protocol and cloud providers have schemes or, or certain implementations they've built like for example amazon has the virtual private cloud where you can have a private cloud space and you know it's guaranteed secure and it, it has high encryption on it. Uh, the other thing you could do is on the operating systems you have, you can actually put you know, data at rest to be encrypted by the OS level. And then you can use things like uh, the, the tools that exist on Amazon at least would be something like a security group. So you can control the ports and you can individualize how, uh, how what, what ports are open. Is it UDP? Is it TCP? And by controlling all of these, you can, you can see what's going in and out of the system. So this is an obvious best practice, but I think this is also an important one, knowing that, as I mentioned before, if you do build an effective marketing engine and you need it to go to the, the right person, you also want to make sure hackers don't get in midway through and, and manipulate your message, right? So that's also a, one of these future problems that could come up. For a moment, I wanted to just talk about the infrastructure cost planning when you have scalability and elasticity. And I also just wanted to uh, define these terms. So number one, scalability, what does that mean? So just briefly, I'll say scalability is how easily can we expand the system resources, right? Elasticity is how easily can we modify the size of the size of the group? So if we, depending on the demands, can we grow it or shrink it, right? So when we're looking at, uh, you know, our cost analysis and our infrastructure costs. One of the problems today is we've had to take kind of these two approaches, which I'm calling scale up approach and scale out approach. So scale up approach would be like, let's say you have a system, you know the system's not running so well, uh, the market automation tool, and you just shoot for the start and say, hey, we're just going to reinvest and build, you know, bigger database, bigger, uh, more CPU, more RAM, everything just big, right? And what you end up doing is you spend a whole huge amount of money and you're not even sure if you've reached kind of the high watermark, right? So that can be problematic and that's kind of depicted with the, the yellow line you see there. And then we have the scale out approach, which is more about, okay, we don't meet the demands, but every so often we get a certain investment and we're just gonna try to keep up with whatever's going on, right? So that that's kind of under investing in what we have. And I guess given the the functionality from the cloud, which is really about um, getting metrics from a server and then being able to reactively do something about it, right? We have what we call that um, automated elasticity, which is really just following the demand requirements and then kind of riding that wave like a surfer would do. So jumping back to the best practices, number six. Number six is end-to-end -end integration testing. So this one I would say for me is probably one of the most important areas of uh, work. And I think it's probably the most underinvested. So I would say, End-to-end -end integration testing, what it really entails is if you have any sort of marketing automation system, and it doesn't even have to be real-time, but it's especially important in a real-time system, uh, you will have, as I mentioned before, different nodes within the system or different applications or services uh, that are kind of in a chain, right? And to be able to effectively test any transaction happening across those, you're going to have to plan out some sort of strategy because if you have an SLA, how do you figure out what the SLA is? How do you know if it's working effectively? You have to have capture points at each node. You have to have someone testing at a certain point in time. You have to have someone orchestrating the actual test. Once you capture the information, then you have to pull the data together, give out a report, give an optimization strategy, and then kind of do actions of that. So you can see it's it's kind of a lot of work when you really put it out on paper and, and then ask everyone to do the work. Um, and I think in most cases, when people invest in a real-time solution, they've invested so much in the beginning that when you get to the end-to-end -end testing, people just want the thing to work a little bit, right? So I would say if you ever have extra money, spend it on end-to-end -end integration testing. It will never go to waste. And if you think about it, 
any extra money you spend there, it's going to improve your SLA. You're either going to know your SLA is bad, or you're going to improve on how know how to improve it, or you will be be able to improve it. So, in my opinion, number six is one of the ones where, uh, if invested more, I think this is going to solve a lot of companies' problems with their real time channels. Because once a real time channel is even deployed today, I found that the adoption rate isn't always high unless you know, between the marketer and even the customers, there's like a, a bridge between the two. Number seven, security vulnerability testing. So this one's really about hardening your software and making sure your whole system, your market information suite is strong. And uh, the way you do this is by, you know, hammering the server with cross site scripting, SQL injection, command injection, any mechanism you can have to actually try to break the system. And uh, I mean, this one is, I think for most companies, they're having some security pen test or some sort of test they have today that allows them to, on a corporate level, check this. But uh, today, I mean, I've seen such creative ways of people breaking into systems. So, I mean, this one's really important and it's evolving every day. Number eight, performance load testing. So this is really around establishing uh, not only SLA, but also uh, getting a baseline of what is the average time and then what is the high watermark of, of how far we can go, right? So I have another slide about this one that I'll briefly talk a little bit more about performance load testing. So I'll, I'll talk a bit more there. Um, number nine, campaign QA testing. So this is really about saying, am I contacting the right customer and can I validate that the information is going to the right people? So a good example of this could be, let's say you're a large casino, right? And you contact... Uh, responsible gaming list. So a, a set of customers that you're not supposed to contact, right? Uh, one of the things that you need to make sure in your system is that there's some sort of gatekeeper or some sort of check brand that just lets you know that you're you're contacting the right person. And let's say you do make mistakes, right? Do you have an auditability chain? So being able to have an audit log and check that is very important, especially in our future world of having, you know, things like Castle and, and there's all sorts of legislation where I think this is going to further evolve and, and us having the tools and techniques to be able to capture what's going on is going to be more important. Number 10, adopt a maximize API in real time mindset. So this is really about saying this, if you have a whole set of tools, a whole suite of marketing automation tools that are working together, uh, it's in your best interest to design the tools to utilize existing APIs from available services. And I think most people will find this obvious, right? Like you, you should obviously use what you have, right? But the reason I'm saying this is I've seen this happen also. I've seen a lot of companies where there's a lot of technical people that get very excited, they build a whole bunch of APIs and a suite of APIs, but there's no user adoption. And then you end up having a, a bunch of useful, let's say useful functions, but nobody really understands how to use those functions. And then there's never really, you know, like when you want to divide and conquer, you break little pieces. Well, people never get to the step two because step one, even though they built a lot of complex pieces, nobody knows how to use them, right? So I think, I think building a mindset where the whole point of building anything is adoption is a good thing. And I think kind of taking it down like a trickle down, trickle down effect by saying, hey, anytime I want to build something, is anybody else doing this? And can I leverage what they have already, right? So I think most organizations want to do this, but um, I think kind of just pointing it out here is something to really think about when you move to the cloud, it's an opportunity because most of everything on the cloud is generally API driven. So this kind of thinking will really help strategically when you start planning out your environment. So I mentioned performance load testing. So just to kind of reiterate what that means, I, I have this slide which kind of breaks it up into pieces. So performance load testing, what is that? So first of all, there's baseline load testing, figuring out what is the baseline um, performance of the system, right? Endurance testing. So endurance testing will be how long can I, can I hit a server and how long can it handle that load, right? Volume testing would be what's the maximum volume I can hit? Like what, when am I gonna start hitting, uh, you know, these high watermarks on my system and start seeing stress or resource contention? Scalability testing. So this would be, if I start sending a lot of requests to my server, will it be able to scale up and spawn a bunch of other nodes and will the clusters actually keep up? And then spike testing would be something like a Black Friday event. So could I, could I send enough hits to my server that it could actually crash the server? And, and you want to crash it just for the purpose of improving it so it doesn't happen again, right? And then stress testing would be more like, instead of spike testing, it would be more like over periods of time, like let's say every week, you knew nine to five, you get a lot of hits. So could you send an automated test for a few, you know, for let's say a month and hit the server, right? So getting all this data while it takes a while to set it up and you can see the capture and all the orchestration could take time. In my opinion, it's heavily worth it. Uh, you, a lot of times in marketing automation uh, organizations where they're using these tools, I found people understand the tools. They don't understand where all the performance is being lost. And then when people are frustrated at the tool, they don't know where to point. So in 
I think knowledge is power. And, and this is one way to get some of that knowledge, especially on the operational side. So uh, if you ever do a budget for it, end-to-end -end testing and performance testing, I think is worth the money. Um, especially it's not, it's not actually about making the fastest channel. It's more about understanding where the problems are so that if you did want to prove it, you could at least focus the investment, right? In, in actual tangible places. So here are some product agnostic shared benefits of, of moving to the cloud. So first of all, I mentioned this before about the, the redundancy that you could reduce it. So this is really about if you reduce the redundancy, then when you consolidate your activities and move, it, that, move your tools to the cloud, you can leverage a lot of the cloud providers, global infrastructure and bundled cloud services. So this includes things like audit monitoring, audit monitoring and logging and also delivery services. So a lot of cloud services have bundled email uh, systems. I mean, depending on what your, your delivery system, that might not work, but still there's options. There's also the improvement of system performance. So this one, this one is the big one where if you do abstract everything and you do have that ability to have elasticity, uh, your scalability uh, is possible. And I mean, your ability to really generalize what your organization is doing and focus their activities on um, on actual complex activity. That's that's one of the benefits I think of moving to the cloud. I think uh, when you're moving to the cloud, one of the things you will go through is a practice of saying, okay, we're, what are we doing multiple times? What aren't we doing so well? And if we move to the cloud, what are things more effectively? So uh, that happens with moving to the cloud. And I think when it comes to managing, let's say you have multiple environments or multiple servers, uh, one of the other things you're able to do is dynamically manage environments, right? And, and see, okay, what am I actually using? So for example, if you have today four environments and you know you only need three, uh, maybe reducing it to one, one less could help, and then you could reinvest some of the, the money, right? So I think dynamic management on the cloud and some of the metrics you get by just getting additional operational metrics about a system, this is in, this is very, very powerful. And I think when you have an on-premise system, sometimes you're not fully aware of the capability that, that you have there. And then finally, I think reducing overall deployment complexity. So I think, as I mentioned before, on-premise environments, while they can be complex, if they get complex enough, it, it's, it becomes a very big headache to deploy anything. So I think uh, cloud services, one of the, the major benefits is the ability to templatize a lot of the tools and services you use. And then finally, when you do deploy, you can do a lot of things like automated deployment. And if you know how to use a lot of like features, like uh, you know, if you can use streaming services in combination with deployment tools, like things like Jenkins, you can do really, really fancy stuff on the cloud. But I think uh, you have to know what you're doing and, and the complexity does go up because it's a, it's a, the cloud brings a lot of firepower with it. So if you're considering migration planning, I would say on the Munvo side, what we like to look at when you're gonna look at moving to the cloud is uh, two areas uh, where we, we kind of start. So we, we typically have discovery sessions around the campaign management module of, of any of the marketing automation tools, and then the interaction of the real-time module of those tools. And the reason why I would say that is, if you consider the marketing automation suite, the core engine that's really kind of pulling customer data, segmenting those customers, figuring out the message, logging that to some sort of contact history, and then also keeping track of some sort of responses or response attribution, that is happening in the campaign management module. And typically how most of these are set up is that they have a real-time module, which is similar to the campaign module, but uh, it's targeted towards a one-to-one -one, uh, conversation and it would have a different type of architecture. So there'd be more of a customer facing server, which is a runtime server. And then you'd have some sort of workspace, which is a design time server. And the whole challenge becomes uh, one, that those real-time servers have to be able to connect to customers and, and interact, right? But then you capture event-based information and have to take that information, process it into derived information, and then ETL it back so that it can get back to the contact and response attribution model of the campaign management side, right? So that whole kind of wheel that's spinning, if you unpack those parts of that wheel and, and just say, for example, you're not on the cloud today, but you want to move. If you just look at what are we doing in campaign, what are we doing on the interaction side? And then you take the spokes on that wheel and then you move them to the cloud and do an analysis of that. That's very valuable, I think, in my opinion. And, and the reason I would say that as opposed to even saying going starting like with a marketing operations is that um, when you work on something like marketing operations, it's, it can be too big of a beast. There's so many things that that software can do, but the core functionality is not focused enough. And it, I, I would say, if you do wanna choose products, these are the places to go. And um, if you see there, I have a common important migration component. So that's just highlighting that the spokes on those wheels for campaign and interaction are things like the file system, web application server, proxy servers, uh, relational database servers. So these are, could be DB2, you know, Oracle, uh, system tables, history tables. 
And then the considerations that come up, which are big ones are, let's say you have ge geographical separation, right? You have some servers in Singapore, you have some in uh, Canada, right? If you wanted to synchronize this data, could you do it? And, and how would what are the implications on your business? So what if you could only run jobs in, uh, you know, in Canada and then you need to run them in Singapore right after, right? Like if you, if you didn't have synchronized data, the data wouldn't match up, right? So cloud technology allows you to do a lot, but you have to, you have to make sure that if you have a global system, that it's, it's working for everyone, right? And the last part of that is in terms of formatting and data, I think the last part is if you ever do need to change your database or change any sort of um, tool you're using, Keep in mind about data formats because data formats, even though they're pretty straightforward in, in a lot of cases, there's always a few nuances, especially with dates and different formats and that kind of thing. So uh, number systems and all this kind of stuff can kind of change depending on the architecture. So uh, that's one to just call out, but um, this is kind of the strategy we take at, at Munvo. And when you think about project size and length uh, at Munvo, I mean, my experience myself, I've, I played a lot of different roles. Um, and I mentioned before that generally we started more from an architect kind of consultant role. And then uh, over time, it was moving more kind of to a strategic planner. And uh, at Munro, we have people kind of across the board. So technical advisors, business architects, implementation solution consultants, project managers, and just general educators on these topics. And uh, in terms of sizes of projects, they vary from, you know, the short ones are probably three months to six months. And then we have larger ones, which are, you know, six to 18 months, and they can be even larger than that. So if you're wondering the variation uh, and why that would happen, typically the variation of implementations, I mean, uh, there's a lot of reasons why, but I'll give you a general reason why that happens a lot. So a lot of big companies, um, what happens is you have different groups in the company, right? And uh, if it's an enterprise software, uh, what could happen is some of these large companies purchase multiple softwares and they do it for different reasons and it's generally organic. But let's say you bought, you know, uh, you had all, let's say you had all three, let's say you had Adobe, HCL and SaaS, right? If you have all three of these products and one's doing the scoring, another one's doing segmentation, and then the final one's doing, you know, the contact offer assignment, contact history logging, right? All of these products I've named can do all of those functions, but if they're separated, there's an overhead cost of the integration of all those tools. And then also the data models don't match, right? So you have to figure out what do you do? And if you have a custom one, did you build an extra one? So you have to think about that. And, and in our experience, I mean, I've seen a lot of customers with one to three to four. I mean, I've seen all sorts of things, right? So uh, generally speaking, I think this is an opportunity to minimize what you're doing. And while uh, we're not trying to remove tools and make everything uh, simple, I think the, the whole idea here is to reduce system complexity and I, that final point I have there about system availability is, is what I want to talk about. So let's say you have a system that you want to be, uh, you want, want it, you want its SLA or the real-time channels on that system to be, to be very uh, performant, right? Uh, so this could be, for example, let's say you're a re retailer and when customers walk into the store, you want to market an offer to their phone through, a, through an iBeacon, right? So if you were going to set that up, one of the things you have to consider from a budgeting perspective is even if, you, if you're moving to the cloud, it's great because you can kind of keep track of what's going on. But the part where it becomes challenging is if you have an SLA where it can't take two minutes for my message to get to the customer, I need it to come in 30 seconds, right? Uh, you're going to have to pay for the availability of the system, right? And that generally looks like on the back end, like high availability node systems, failover switches, and then ha also having some sort of monitoring system around it, right, to maintain that. So. I think the variation can point to either, you know, different products or can uh, point to SLAs and, and, and meeting those SLAs, right? So in our experience, we've kind of done all. I've, I've had really simple projects where it's been one product uh, and it's been very complex just because of the, the scale of the project or the SLAs are very high, right? Or very low, I mean. Um, and then I've had the opposite where they have met, there's many products and what we're doing in each system is very simple, right? But it's just complexity because there's so many products. So. That's kind of that's kind of the the idea of the the variation in implementation, and I think at Mindro the message is just that we can help you with any of these problems, and and we clearly love working in this space. So um, finally, here I want to share some lessons learned, and uh, these lessons learned are kind of my own personal gems of wisdom that I've kind of had from the experience of working on projects. And uh, I already mentioned it before, but number one here is uh, end integration testing. So this one is generally underestimated. Uh, it's what would basically test if the final, let's call it real-time system, is actually sending out what it needs to send and it's getting to the right person and it's actually meeting the SLA, which means that the time it takes from point A to point Z is exactly what it needs to be, right? Um, so this whole kind of test and, and, and verifying this, this can take time and I mentioned why before, but uh, as I mentioned before, my general um, wisdom here is add a contingency buffer for end-to-end -end testing. Uh, and integration. So 
if you do do this, I, I guarantee you that I bet you your investment's going to go in a good place because I haven't ever seen a company overinvest in this. So uh, I really do think that if you do this, more than likely, even if the channel doesn't reach the SLA, the people doing the test will know where you should invest money for your next project. So that's that's what I think you, what would be a good thing to do. Uh, or two is success relies on teamwork and communication. So this might seem like an obvious one for humans, but this is the point I want to make here. Cloud technology, cloud, SaaS, all these words. These are just words. So the computers haven't really changed, right? And, and, and the internet's been out for a while. So I think the point here is that we're using uh, new names for the same things. And the whole point here is to really educate people, inspire teams that we can do things and enable functionality with these tools. So I think that's what this is more about, being able to communicate with people and show people and enable people to do what they did before. But the important part here and where we have to have a lot of communication is that data privacy, data security, and, and how much is at risk, that is sometimes underestimated. So I think that can be solved though with teamwork and, uh, and communication. And the final lesson I have here is incremental change. So uh, if you think about a big marketing automation suite, it's huge. Uh, I think you have to do incremental change. Uh, this minim minimizing the big bang approach where you deploy a whole bunch of features and try to get adoption. Uh, I found that when you deploy too many features and nobody's adopting them, uh, it stays that way. So it's typically better to break it up into pieces. So divide and conquer, which I think most people in software engineering would also agree this is a good tactic, uh, but it, it does work. and uh, it helps you do. It helps you to stay course. And um, I, I think one of the biggest things I've learned from marketing automation tools is that while they're very, very, very powerful, they're generally underutilized across the board. And the reason why is because a lot of the advanced functionality, it's hard to deploy them. It's hard in in a way of it's hard to get users to adopt them because for them to adopt them, they have to build a practice around them, right? And building a practice around a tool is a lot harder than just showing. Uh, someone, you know, a 15 step process, right? So uh, incremental change works over time and building a knowledge base. I mean, over time and seeing that grow is is the best approach. So that's all I have for today. Thank you and great job. We did receive a few questions throughout the presentation. So I wanna thank everyone for sending those in. Uh, if you're ready, we'll get started. Sure. So the first one here um, is, what is your preferred methodology or approach when going to the cloud? So from steps to phases and effort. That's a good one. Okay, so uh, my methodology for going to the cloud, I mentioned before that uh, number one at Munvo, one of the, the methodologies we like to use is uh, taking the campaign management module and the interaction module and taking those to kind of break it apart. I think the second part of that is as soon as you do that, that phase one will be looking at the campaign side. Phase two or, or 1.2 would be looking at the interact side, right? But I think as soon as you start unpacking what those are, easily you're gonna get a phase two and three because the amount of time it takes generally to unpack what you've built, take some time and uh, I would side when maturity is high. So if a company has been working with a tool for a while, uh, they generally built some customizations, which is great. You know, uh, it could be custom triggers, custom sort of tooling, right? But that also means when you move to the cloud, you need to figure out some sort of migration strategy or some sort of porting strategy, right? So um, I think uh, number one methodology is use the two modules, so campaign interact, and then the second part of that is uh, take start looking at all the dependencies, and then that'll break up into kind of one, two, and three for me. From your own experience, can you briefly discuss an example of a successful transition to the cloud? And where did that success lie? Yeah, sure. Uh, so one, I've, I've had a few projects with uh, with cloud migration. So one, one that comes to mind that was a successful project was kind of an international one for us. So uh, in this situation, it was a uh, international payments company and uh, they were migrating their an automation system from an MSP uh, in uh, the Asia Pacific area, and they were moving into a global system on the uh, on their uh, American side, right? So uh, in this case, we got to work with tools like Unica, and and the I would say the we we did have success, and we did have some problems in that, and some of the problems were around what I just mentioned. So uh, in their case, they uh, this company had used the tool for uh, quite a few years. They had their own kind of practices around them, but the difference for them was between their own team, which was on the Asia Pacific side, and then their team on the U.S. side. Right? They had a different set of practices, so uh, it became a big people problem. Where by getting to know the people and understanding the tools well, we were able to kind of bridge the gap. So I would say, as I mentioned before, while the tools and technology can get complex, the, the hardest part of it all was the teamwork portion and communication and us being on site and being able to work with people and, and make friends with people. I think that was kind of the, 
the message or the recipe for our success. So we have time for just a few more. Um, the next question is, will an enterprise's GDPR processes need to be updated when moving to the cloud? Okay. Um, the answer is, the short answer is yes. So if, if you're considering GDPR or, I mean, you could take this even broader. So I would say any sort of compliancy. If you are, have, do, are, have any sort of compliancy today, like Castle, right? So if you have any compliancy today and uh, you have it in your marketing automation system, uh, there's two parts to that. There's the business part of what you're trying to achieve, and then there's the technical part. So I would say for sure, no matter what, when you're moving to the cloud, you're going to have to reassess it. Why? If you're moving to the cloud, it's a set of abstracted systems. So you need to now, when you're getting audited in the future, know wait, where does the ser where's the server located? So for example, if it if the server is located in a country where uh, your organization is not allowed to store that information. You know, at the get-go, it's it could be a problem. So, uh, yeah. So that I think that that is probably. Uh, does that answer the question? It does. Yeah. No, it's great. Yeah. Um, okay. We actually have just enough time for one more question. So good timing here. Okay. Um, what is the biggest issue that companies tend to overlook when planning to move to the cloud? Okay. So I, I would say the biggest issue that companies have when planning to move to the cloud is uh the underestimation of previous investments so this would be so for example let's say your company where you've been there for uh five years right i would say at most companies where i've seen a marketing automation solution uh generally speaking people are always not happy like and i, I don't mean that in a, in a very cynical way but i mean in a way of if you're an analyst working on the tool you've been running flowcharts i've always noticed people are complaining about the performance issues on the system right uh and people aren't quite aware about all of the, maybe the, the ingenuity that's happened. So let, let me give you an example. So if we have a set of flowcharts that are running really slow at a company, right? Maybe it's running slow, but all the time that went into the data model and building all that data model and that, that tying all the information together and it has all sorts of back feeds and all this, I mean, some of that becomes invisible sometimes. And I, I think for newcomers, sometimes people blame the system for, uh, without realizing what it can actually do. And then when they want to move to the cloud, they want to gut the system, get another enterprise offer, and they think they can just kind of just head start, right? Like maybe basically run before they walk, right? And I think the message here is that uh, as an organization, I think you need to walk before you run, right? And that walking, I mean, most companies are investing in something in their marketing, right? So uh, I think the mistake sometimes is when companies get too glamored by the idea of a customer journey, and then the sales team sell them all these customer journey ideas, and they don't explain to them that, hey, a customer journey is actually based off of the same campaign data that you would have captured 10 years ago. All you got to do is tie all the information together. And the problem today is that tying all that information is challenging, which is what we're trying to point at, right? So if you could tie the information together and basically say, okay, I have invested in before and I want to leverage what I've invested in the past, then you put yourself in a position to actually use that information. So I think um, the, the good part of it is that if you start realizing as a company what you've done in the past and see that the customer journey and actually building that view is more about tying together real-time data, real-time channels, take the batch data, take the batch data. Uh, and then once you tie all of that together, you're able to build out a journey where you can say, okay, you want the customer to go somewhere, but you're going to try to steer the customer somewhere. And that's what the marketing campaigns ideally do, right? So um, I would say that's kind of the big one where uh, companies sometimes are getting too maybe glamored by salespeople from big market information companies, but um, that's natural. That's a software business, right? So I would say that's that's probably my uh, my piece of wisdom there. Excellent, thank you. We've just about run out of time, but if we didn't address your question live during the webinar, we'll reach out to you shortly. Otherwise, please don't hesitate to contact us on Monvo.com or via LinkedIn. Thanks again for joining, and have a great rest of your day.